Uh, let's turn first to the um, liturgy. And the, the liturgy selection uh, is going to, uh, from the Torah part for the Hebrew, I'm just going to read the standard blessing for the Torah uh, in Hebrew and um, English and Hebrew, and then we'll jump over to some reading from the Greek. And there's nothing special about this reading other than what I want to highlight is that notice how Judaism, who crafted these words, has made it a point to to recognize and thank God for the privilege and the duty and the responsibility of studying Torah and knowing that this is a part of our heritage as a people group of God. And this is going to bounce off of something that the writer to the book of Hebrews is going to tell us in a moment. So let's just jump right into this. I pulled this uh, file from um, uh, HebrewForChristians.com and I just snipped a, a page off and, and saved it to my computer. But Hebrew, the word Hebrew, the number four, the word Christians is where you can find this, this uh, Hebrew here. Let's just read first. Let me just skip past the Hebrew and read the English first uh, that you can see on your page here, right? Uh, and then we'll read the, the, the Hebrew after that, okay? So, um, starting right here. Give me a second. My page is moving a little slower. There we go. Uh, the English says, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves with the words of Torah. Please, Lord our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouths and in the mouths of all your people, Israel. May we and our offspring and in the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, may we all together know your name and study your Torah for the sake of fulfilling your desire. Blessed are you, Lord, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. And then we have some more uh, paragraphs. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the nations and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. So no, notice this is all about God giving his word to us which can become an idol if we're not careful. So we just have to read these words in context, okay? We're not we're not worshiping the Torah. We're worshiping the God who gave us the Torah. But what a wonderful gift it is. Omi? All right, let's keep reading. May the Lord bless you and keep watch over you. May the Lord make his presence enlighten you, and may he be kind to you. May the Lord bestow favor on you and grant you peace. Let's go back up and read the Hebrew of the same uh, selection. Again, this is available on Hebrew for Christians. Dot com if you're interested. And if we had that, that web page pulled up, we could actually click on this. If you notice, there's kind of a little speaker icon next to the Hebrew. You can click on that and you'll hear someone chant the um, uh, the Hebrew for you. But I'll, I'll do it for you myself. I won't chant it. I'll just actually read it for you. Uh, the Hebrew says, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech Ha'olam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotayv, V'tzivanu La'asuk B'divrei Torah. It continues, Ba'arev na Adonai Elohinu et divre Toratecha Bufinu Ufi Ancha Beit Yisrael. It continues, Nihye Anachnu Fetze etze Enu Fetze etze E Amcha Beit Yisrael Kulano Yode Shmecha Velom de Toratecha Lishma Baruchata Adonai Ham Lame Torah La Amo Yisrael. And then the middle paragraph right here, the starting right there where my mouse is, it reads, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Mekol HaAmim, Benatan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTara. And then the final three lines, which is straight out of the Bible, this is the what we call the Aaronic Benediction or the uh, Priestly Blessing that you can find in your Bible in the book of Numbers. It says, um, shalom. And that will be the Hebrew reading for tonight. Let's turn now to the Apostolic Scriptures, your New Testament part of your Bible, and pull a passage out of the book of Hebrews. And this is going to actually link directly to the short little video that we watched, that we're going to watch here in a moment. But notice that the right up to the book of Hebrews takes the Torah and its sacrificial system and he doesn't discard it. He doesn't even disapprove of it or dismantle it or denigrate it or any of those negative things. But what he does do is he puts it into the proper context of the overall scope of salvation plans and history that God has for mankind. So we end up getting just a very brief snapshot of understanding um, how the Torah fits in to uh, salvation history. And so it's unfortunate that after 2,000 years of 
a traditional Gentile uh, church history that we have been uh, led to believe that the Torah has been defeated by the law of Christ, or it's been set aside and relaxed by the uh, fulfillment of Jesus, or Paul tells us we're no longer under the law. Thus, we have what was termed a law-free gospel, where we as Christians, particularly Gentile ones, we are no longer um, need to concern ourselves with all that Torah stuff. Don't worry about all that. It's all been done away with, right? It's been it's it's a it, it's been relegated to a bygone era or a different dispensation. But the writer of the book of Hebrews doesn't say that. So let's read what he has to say. Uh, I'm only going to read two short verses, just verse uh, one and two for our uh, liturgy tonight. Starting right here in the English, uh, on the left side of the page, it says, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse one. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Uh, this translation says, but a shadow. That, that word but is actually in the Greek, so that's a translator. Really, since the law has a shadow of the good things to come. So we, we don't even right away have to see that the shadow is something that's negative. Uh, we don't have to use the word but there, as if it is like less than. It has its limitations, that's true. Um, uh, however, uh, I don't think the writer of the Hebrews was trying to convey that. Let's read verse 2. Um, so we know that it, that it has its limitations, its built-in limitations, its God-given limitations, the law and its sacrifices. Uh, and he says in verse 2, otherwise, meaning if it didn't have these limitations, then it would be a system by with where wherewith we could have cleansing on the inside and the outside. But what does the writer to the book of Hebrews say in verse 2? He knows that it doesn't have that ability to cleanse on the inside. He says, if it did, that's the, the context of what he's about to say. Otherwise, would they, speaking of the, the, the participants, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, right, by bringing the blood of the animals, having been, once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? So we know that the, uh, the, the, the Torah with its sacrificial system, which is a major part of the, of the, the um, instructions that we read about in the Torah, it has its built-in limitations. And even though we don't have a sacrificial system today, the theology behind what the writer to the book of Hebrews is giving us here does not um, preclude us from the possibility of bringing this after sacrificial system back into service should there be the, the, the opportunity. God allows a temple to be rebuilt and God allows priests to be reinstituted and animals to be uh, reinstituted and things like that. We could feasibly bring the sacrificial system back into service if God deemed it so. And I believe that um, there's probably going to be at least two uh, opportunities for the sacrificial system to uh, be restarted. One Probably in the in the in the immediate near future, uh, probably national Israel and rabbinic Judaism, religious Judaism of today, unsaved Judaism is probably going to uh, find a way to restore the sacrificial system in part, uh, regather the priestly lineage, and begin offering sacrifices. It's not likely that this will have any messianic significance for us Christians. Uh, because there will probably be heavy restrictions on who can approach uh, the temple and the altar and, and, and everything like that. It will probably be highly uh, regulated, as, as everything in religious Judaism is, restrictive, uh, nationalistic, um, uh, very what Christians would probably call legalistic and things like that. And so I'm not really looking forward to that type of return, and I don't have any um, anticipation towards... Um, joining those uh, celebrations and things like that, that you know being a messianic jew being a believer in jesus they're not likely to allow me to bring any type of sacrifice and i don't foresee any christians wanting to go participate anyway since most christians repudiate sacrifices many jews do as well but most christians repudiate them based on the the idea that uh, animal sacrifices compete with the death of messiah so um all that said and done national israel will have what they want bit of Judaism, uh, religious Judaism, and most Christians will have what they want. It's the Messianic Jews will kind of be kind of in a quandary going, what do we do? What do we do? Um, so uh, that, that's kind of what's going to happen. That, that's the first return. But after that, and after all of that's destroyed, which it will be according to Torah prophecy, then as we usher in the new millennial kingdom, I believe 
that there will be an opportunity for Messiah to rebuild the temple, to reinstitute the sacrifice, to reconstitute the priesthood, and that and that uh, we will then have the opportunity to know what the sacrificial system means to do it uh, under the banner of Yeshua. And when that takes place, then, oh yeah, you bet, I'm going to be there, front and center, at least if I can. Um, and I'm praying that uh, many millions of Christians will also want to go participate in that system as well. Oh, man? Oh, man. All right, well, that's enough said for the liturgy. Turned it into a little sermon there, didn't mean to. Okay, let's turn now to the Greek of Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1 over here. There we go. Uh, the Greek says, Skian gater ekon ha namas ton melanton agathon uk autain ten ekana ton pragmaton kat ini autan tais autais thusiais has prosferusen esta di enicus u depate dunatai tus pros irkamenus tele osai. And verse 2 down here says, Epe uk an epausanta prosferamenai dieta medemian ekain eti sune desen hamartion tus latriantas hapax kekatharis minus. And that'll be the liturgy from the Greek.